Welcome back to Vintage Camera Digest. Today we're going to look at a camera that I'd say is very niche, the Yashica Dental Eye. Known and loved around the world by dentists of a certain age, that is, my age or older, it's a camera designed for a specific purpose, to photograph teeth. But can we push it beyond that? Stick around to find out. So when a dentist friend of mine was getting ready to retire, he was looking to get rid of this camera. And I had seen them for sale in the ads in the back of old photo magazines for years, but I'd never seen one in person. So I thought, what the heck, I'll see what I can do with it. It does come with a nice case. And some dental accessories, mirrors and whatnot. Ah, yes. Anyway, it is a decent looking camera, I suppose, but the first thing you're gonna notice is this massive lens, which is, by the way, non-interchangeable. But it's a 100 millimeter F4 that's capable of macro photography down to a one-to-one -one magnification. You'll also notice that it has a ring flash built into the housing. It's also important to mention right off that this lens will not focus to infinity. It's for close-up use only. The farthest distance you're able to focus is a little less than two meters or about six feet. Now everything about this camera except focusing is automatic. Film loading, automatic. Film winding, automatic. Film rewind, automatic. Exposure, yes, 100% automatic. There are no shutter speed or aperture controls, and film speed is set by DX coding. So if your film isn't DX coded, the camera is going to default to ISO 100. But for a bit of a backstory, and what would one of my videos be without some backstory, right? This is the third generation of the dental eye. The first camera specifically for dental use was the Oral Eye, which was a modified Yashica Electro 35 rangefinder. Now, I can't imagine how cumbersome that would have been to use, because if you've seen my video on the regular Electro 35, you might remember that I had the close-up attachment and it wasn't a walk in the park to use it. So somewhere along the line, Yashica decided to build an SLR to make the job easier. Well, actually, they just took one of their existing SLRs, the FX3, and modified it. For the first version of the Dental Eye, which was 1983, I believe, they fitted the camera with a non-removable 55 millimeter F4 close focusing lens. And they fixed the shutter speed at 1 1 25th of a second. And apertures were set automatically based on the magnification ratio of the lens. The flash would always fire at full power, but the closer you got to the subject, the aperture would stop down to keep it from being overexposed. And this also helped with the depth of field at super close distances. The second and third generation of the camera swapped out that 55 millimeter lens with the 100 millimeter, which allowed you to get a one-to-one -one magnification without having to get so close to your patient. As for the controls on this third version, well, it doesn't have much. On the top right, you've got the shutter release with the on-off switch around the base. What you'd expect to be a shutter speed dial is only an exposure compensation dial. And at the base of that is the flash setting switch. And there's a self timer button, which will come in handy on the shoot we're about to do because the remote cord, which attaches back here, is a special cord. And even though it looks like a standard cable release socket, it isn't. And just to the right of the eyepiece is the rewind switch in case you've only shot part of the roll of film and are ready to take it out. The camera comes standard with a special date back that lets you record basic info like the date that prints on the negative. It's powered by a separate battery, but since I don't want anything printed on my negatives, I'm leaving the battery out. Basically, the only thing that you can set on this camera is whether the flash fires and how many of the three units will do so. There's no wind lever, film transport is automatic. You do have a small LCD panel that tells you if the film is loaded properly and what frame you're on. In the viewfinder, there's no information at all except a green LED that shows that the flash is fully charged. The same LED will blink six times per second for a low light warning if the flash is turned off. And the focusing screen is a split image rangefinder type with micro prism color. Now about that flash switch, there are three settings, on, off, and a setting that fires only the bottom two flash units. And I'm assuming that will be helpful in photographing teeth but for regular macro work, having the light come from the bottom and cast shadows above the subject 
isn't going to be the best light. And if I were able to turn the bottom flashes off and just have the top unit fire, it might work better for what I want to shoot. The battery is a regular 2CR5 camera battery, so that's pretty easy to find. Behind the scenes though, the specs are pretty impressive. The shutter speed range is 16 seconds all the way to 1 4,000th of a second. Flash sync is at 1 1 25th of a second, and the aperture range is f4 to f22. But there are some serious limitations that come with using this thing, and the biggest one for me is that when you turn the flash off, the shutter speed is variable, but the aperture is locked at f4. And when you're doing macro work, you usually don't want to shoot with the lens wide open since your depth of field is going to be really thin. Turning the flash on will give you access to all the other apertures, again based on the magnification of the subject. But ring flash lighting is going to make that subject look pretty flat, and it's probably not the look you'll be going after if you're into macro work. It may be perfect for documenting teeth, but we'll have to see how this translates to normal photography. And that's what we're really here testing. Is this going to be a useful tool, or is it something you should just pass on? Well, I picked up a $10 bouquet of flowers from the supermarket as my subject, and I'm also going to make use of my Minolta 8000i with a 100mm macro lens to compare results to. Basically, will the ability to choose apertures other than f4 be a huge benefit? I'm thinking probably so, but let's find out. All right, so we've flipped to the room here and we're gonna take some photos with the Yashica Dental i3. Uh, I'm also, since I've gone to the trouble of setting all this up, I'm going to uh, also shoot with the Minolta 8000i with the 100 millimeter macro as well, just to see what the differences are gonna be. Obviously, we're sort of limited on what this thing can do because it is completely automatic. We can use the ring flash on the lens in order to adjust the aperture, but we have no idea what aperture that is. Uh, we can turn the flash off, which is probably the way that I would rather use this, but then we're stuck with F4, can be changed. I've got two rolls of Pro Image 100. I've got one in the Yashica, I've got one in the Minolta. So we're gonna shoot sort of the same shots with each and just compare. The setup I've got here today is I have a 36 inch soft box here and I have a uh, kicker backlight right here uh, that I'm just going to illuminate just the very back side of this just to give it some depth. I also have this light here that I'm gonna turn off when we get ready to shoot. It'll look like that. All right, let's set up a shot. One thing that I did fail to mention is that I have the camera mounted on a macro rail system. It gives us some very fine detail adjustments front to back as well as side to side. So you can get the focus as close as you think you can, and then you can still adjust the distance with the uh, with the macro rail just to ensure that it is sharp where you want it to be. All right, so the first shot I've got set up, I'm gonna shoot this area right here. We are in fairly tight. And what let's do is I'm gonna shoot one without the flash and then we'll shoot one with the flash. Then we'll move over to the Minolta and shoot without the flash. All right, let's uh, kill this light. All right. I'm gonna use the timer to do this since I don't have a cable release. All right, let's try it with the flash. Oh, you know what I needed to do? I wanted to mist it with water. I'll do that. Let's do that now. What the heck? All right, let's do that again since I didn't mist it with water. All right. All right, now we'll put the flash on. All right, 
So I'm going to switch cameras over to Minolta and we'll do the same thing. So it's telling me one third of a second at F8. Let's see. All right, use the cable release. Nice. All right, figure out the next shot. All right, so now we've moved here. I've misted it with a bit of water, hopefully to catch some highlights, some specular highlights with the water droplets. All right, we're gonna do without flash first. All right, now we'll do with flash. All right, swap out the cameras. All right, we're shooting at F8 again. And let's see. All right. It's just a little bit longer than half a second. All right, got another shot lined up. We're going to do the flash first. And then we will uh, do no flash. All right, turn the flash off. And just remember that we, that means everything is at F4. All right, swap out cameras. See, it's still at F8. All right, I like this right here. Let's go with the Minolta first. So let's hit that. All right, swap over to the dental. Uh, all right. So first we have no flash. flash for this one. All right, so first with the flash. It's sort of flat. The other shots have had more of an angle, so we've got more depth to it, I think. Um, this is more of a flat composition, but still, we'll, we, you know, we still want to see some depth. All right. Flash off, timer on. All right. I would say with the test that I have done so far with this is that the flash isn't necessarily a killer. You definitely get more depth without the flash. But it also sort of depends on what's around the place that I'm trying to shoot. Uh, so I wanted to have, you know, a black background here so we were shooting against nothing. Um, and any shadow that is on the background with the black probably hopefully will be dark enough where we won't see it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have no idea what to expect with this as much as you do. So this is just fun. We're trying to see what it'll do. Manolta turn. All right, so what sort of exposure we've got? I still have it at F11. Let's change that back to F8. All right, 
one half of a second at F8. All right, got another shot here. Um, I've taken just one stem out so we'll have it against black and there won't be so much stuff behind it. Uh, but we're really in so close it's not gonna, I don't think you'll be able to tell what's behind it anyway. Uh, but I am aiming it, I'm, I have been turning everything facing toward the softbox, but this time I'm turning away a little bit and I'm gonna let that backlight kind of shoot through the petals, give us a little bit of depth that way. Uh, so we are with the Minolta first. And the exposure is half a second at F11. All right. All right, so flash first. No flash. All right, so I've changed it up just a little bit. Now we've got these purple. Uh, you know, if I was smart, I'd know all the names of these flowers, so y'all can let me know in the comments. But what I think I wanna do, I wanna put more light on this backlight. I want it more backlit than frontlit, so I'm going to reduce the softbox output. Let's turn that whole thing off for just a second and see. I think that adds some drama. All right, first shot, Manolta. One second at F8. All right, swap out. All right, timer. It was about a second, I would say. Let's do a couple with just the bottom two flashes. Seems like an odd direction for the light to come from the bottom, but I don't know. We'll go with it. Slightly different focus this time. All right, should use a self timer, but anyway. All right, gonna go in super tight. I am going to put more light here in the back. The back light's gonna go up to, it was at 50. Let's go full. Adds a bit of drama. I'll be sure to use a timer this time. Yeah, that's about a second. Splash. That may not be so bad. All right, let's get the manolta on here and do that. One and a half seconds at F8. All right. All right, for this shot, I'm still gonna make more use of the backlight than I am the key here. I've got the backlight on 100%. Let's go back to the key. Let's reduce that some. Let's cut it off and see what we have. Let's cut it completely off and see what we can get. All right, so this is a very light colored flower so the exposure that the Minolta is telling me is one sixth of a second at f8 I'm gonna go a little bit more I'm gonna go one third of a second at f8 
All right, we'll do flash first. All right, no flash. Oh, we've got this light set up this way. We've got this nice, strong back directional light coming in here. Let's make some more use of it. All right, flash. Let's put the Manola back on. Two thirds of a second at F8. Quarter of a second at F8. All right, so first we flash. All right. Now with no flash. So I have taken the flowers down. Now I have a pine cone. Finish up the roll on these. So first shot, I've just got the key, no backlight. I will use the backlight for the next shot though. All right, the Minolta. So that's two seconds at F8. But there's a lot of dark in here, so I think that might be a bit overexposed, but. All right, so that's bringing 100% of that back. I don't need 100%. And I don't need 50. How about a quarter? So first, no flash. That seemed like it was about a second. Now we get flash. All right, so we've got them both shot. Two rolls, hopefully they're pretty much the same, uh, but interested to see what comes out of this and if this is indeed a useful tool for photography. Well, that wasn't as bad as I expected. The non-flash shots looked pretty good, even at F4. Some were better than others, but yeah, I was pleased. I didn't care much for most of the flash shots, but there were a few that I kind of liked. So I guess it's just whatever mood you're in. As far as flexibility, I don't think the dental eye is able to beat a normal SLR macro lens setup. The ability to shoot a smaller aperture to increase depth of field is handy. But this camera is a good bit of fun, and here are some other photos I made with it when I was just messing around. So in conclusion, I think the Yashica Dental i3 is interesting. Is it the ultimate macro photography camera? Nope. It's extremely limited in what it can do. 
And that makes total sense because it does what it was designed to do very well. I started out by admitting it's a very niche camera, but all things considered, it is able to produce some stunning close-ups all the way to a one-to-one -one magnification. I'd enjoy hearing from any of you that have one of these. If you have any tips or tricks you could share, be sure to let me know in the comments. And if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you won't miss all the good stuff coming up. And speaking of that, what is coming up? Well, I'm glad you asked because next up will be a review and shoot with the Canon EF of 1973. This was Canon's only FD mount body that used the Copal Square shutter. So that should be fun. And we'll be starting a series on black and white film developing. No darkroom required. And as part of that, I'll be comparing some different developers because there are a lot to choose from. And we'll be looking at one of the best mechanical cameras ever produced, the Nikon F2. And lots and lots more. And if you have an idea that you'd like to see me cover here, let me know. I've done several episodes over the last six months that came about from ideas y'all left in the comments. So feel free to hit me up with suggestions. You never know. I'll see you next time.